Hello, welcome to Tabletop CP. Today I'm going to be starting a new series on using infantry in chain of command. So I've been wanting to do some tactics videos for a while now. Um, and it's a uh, cold rainy Sunday, so I figured now is as good a time as any. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over all the basics of the game, or the infantry in the game, the uh, force composition, force rating, some of the special rules, and then eventually I'll get the models out and uh, go over some tactics on the tabletop itself to uh, show these kind of things um, in action. So when you first open up your rule book and you're going to the army list section, this is the layout you're going to see. So all the armies have the same same layout. Um, you start off with your platoon force rating, your troop quality, and then you have the platoon headquarters and everything that's in that, and then all your sections or squads and what they are equipped with. So I'm just going to start at the top and I'll just start with force rating. So your force rating is the inherent strength or weakness of the platoon. Uh, so, for example, here we have a German platoon. This is your basic German infantry infantry platoon. A regular platoon is rated zero, and a green platoon is rated negative five. Now, if we turn the page here and we look at a Falschermager platoon, an elite Falschermager platoon's force rating is plus ten. So the way it works is you take the difference between the two platoons face, facing each other, and that is the number of extra support points that the weaker platoon will get. So in this example here, if we had a regular platoon facing off versus a green platoon, the difference is five. Regular is zero, green is negative five. So the green platoon would get five bonus support points um, added on to what their normal support points for that mission would be. On the other hand, if you had an elite false meter platoon at plus ten facing off against a green platoon at minus five, that difference is 15. So you're talking 15 bonus support points for a green platoon, which is a lot. That's enough to bring a lot of heavy weapons or a big tank. Next I'll talk about the troop quality. So you got three types of troops. You got regular troops, green troops, and elite. So regular troops are kind of your baseline. They have some training, maybe a little bit of combat experience, but they're not hardened veterans. Green troops are your conscripts, your militia, unexperienced, untrained men. And then your elite troops are your hardened combat veterans, your highly trained paratrooper platoons, stuff like that. So rules-wise, uh, most of the differences are in deployment distance from jump-off points, as well as the to-hit roles uh, when you're fighting. So a regular platoon. In a close range, you got two ranges. You got a close range and an effective range. There's no minimum range for weapons in this game except for a few light mortars and stuff like that. But rifles, machine guns, there's no there's no uh, range limit on them. They can shoot all the way across the table. What there is, though, however, is range bands. So you got a close range and an effective range. And for almost all infantry weapons, the the line is at 18 inches. So if you're under 18, you're close range. If you're over 18, you're at effective range. So a regular platoon, your baseline, you're hitting, you're getting hit on fours, fives, or sixes in close range, and on five plus at effective range. Green troops, however, are worse, so they are not as good at using the terrain to hide. They're easier to hit. They're standing around, so they're hit on three plus at close range and four plus at long range. Elite troops, uh, they know how to use the terrain, they know how to do everything right, they know how to protect themselves. So they're actually even harder to hit. So they're hitting uh, 5 plus at close range and 6 plus at effective range. And if you have any kind of modifiers in there, like a smoke grenade, which adds a negative 1 modifier to hit, then you can't hit elites at all at long range because you're going from 6 to a 7 and obviously that is not possible so that's a big difference um, elites that's one of the reasons elites are kind of not frowned upon but uh, should be used only in 
specific scenarios. They're not good for just throwing a, throwing out on the on the table for a pickup game or, or for using it for new players because they make it a lot harder to play because they're they're hard to hit. Uh, another difference in uh, troop quality is your deployment. So it, your basic regular platoon can deploy within six inches or up to six inches away from the jump off point. So everyone has to be within six inches of the jump off point. Uh, green platoon, they are not as good so they can only deploy four inches from the deployment point. While an elite platoon can deploy nine inches from a deployment point. So that's your basic differences in troop quality. Uh, next thing I'll go over is the platoon layout itself. Now before I continue on with the forces uh, themselves, I would like to mention that the force ratings have been updated. Um, it's a fan-made thing. I don't think they've been officially updated by two fat lardies. But there is a, a thing out there called the COC calculator. And that is a way for people to make their own platoons. It takes all the weapons and everything, the strengths of the platoon that dictate what the force rating is going to be and it allows you to make your own custom platoons and have an accurate force rating for them. So uh, over at tinyhordes.com uh, it's a great blog for Chain of Command. They got, he's got uh, some campaigns and a lot of updates to, to Chain of Command. Um, specifically the for, uh, Chain of Command force rating update where he's, I believe he's taken the COC calculator and actually gone in and entered all of the uh, platoons and gotten a updated force rating for them. Uh, when the rules were first written, that was before the COC calculator came out. Um, Richard came up with it just so people could create their own platoons. And after it was created, uh, I guess uh, Andy over at uh, Tiny Hordes has went in and hand entered everything into their into the COC calculator and got an updated force rating. So. Um, you could go into his blog and download this and get up-to-date force ratings. And you can also use the COC calculator to make your own platoons. So uh, Now we'll go ahead, I'll, I'll break out some platoons, I'll lay them out, and we'll look at the platoons themselves, talk about some of the special rules as well. The first army we'll look at is the German army, everyone's favorite army, bristling with machine guns. I brought out three different platoons. I brought a Panzer Grenadier platoon. I brought your standard generic mid-war slash late war rifle platoon. And then I brought out an early war German platoon. I've also brought out a tripod mounted uh, belt fed machine gun, medium machine gun. So this is common to every army. It's not part of the platoon, it is a support option, but it is quite common to see these uh, in chain of command and they have a rate of fire of 10 and a effective range of 24 inches and a five-man crew no junior leader so they have to activate on a one or they can be activated by a senior leader and the germans get a special rule which i'll talk about uh, in a few minutes so first platoon we'll look at is the panzer grenadier platoon so this is a waffen ss panzer grenadier platoon but it can also be here or luftwaffe i guess if you wanted to do that. So this is a uh, three squad platoon. You have a platoon leader with SMG, a lieutenant, and you got three squads. Each squad is armed with, or each squad consists of two teams. Each team is a two-man LMG, and one of the teams has three extra riflemen. One of the teams has two extra riflemen. So all the uh, German LMGs are belt-fed, which means they have a rate of fire of eight. And then each rifleman gets one more shot as well. The crew, uh, the crewman, the second crewman does not get a shot as he's feeding the weapon, changing barrels, and so, so on and so forth. So each squad in this platoon also has access to two Panzerfausts. Uh, the squad leader can allocate however he likes. He actually doesn't have to give them to anyone until the moment he needs them. So I do model them. I do put models out with Panzerfaust on them, but technically you don't actually have to do that. You can just say, I'm going to use a Panzerfaust and whoever needs it will have it. Uh, Panzerfaust in this game are very potent. Uh, they're great anti tank weapons. They are a bit short range and inaccurate, but they do have an AP of 11, which is very good. Most of the enemy tanks that you're going to run across, armor maybe six or seven. So. 
you're definitely almost doubling a lot of the uh, armor uh, armor that the allies can throw out there. It's only the bigger IS-2s and KV-1s and stuff that you need to uh, be worried about not being able to penetrate should you hit. But generally if you hit anything with the Panzerfaust, you're going to do something to it. Either add some shock to the tank, make it back up, destroy uh, destroy something like the optics, kill the dry... Uh, there's lots of different things that can happen that you know don't necessarily need you to destroy the entire vehicle. So that's the Panzer Grenadier platoon. You got, like I said, three squads of those guys. So they're probably the most deadly platoon in the game, firepower wise. They can throw out a lot of shots, uh, get a lot of lot, a lot of lead down range. So now we'll move over here to the rifle platoon. So this is also three squads. Uh, headquarters section is a lieutenant with submachine gun. It also has a Panzerschreck team organic to it. Panzerschreck is even better than the Panzerfaust. They have an AP of 13 and a maximum range of 48. So it can reach out and touch someone, that's for sure. It's not as inaccurate as the Panzerschreck either. So it's a very good anti-tank weapon. Between the Panzerfaust and the Panzerschreck in this squad, uh, no enemy armor is going to want to stick their head out anywhere. And definitely they're not going to want to get close to you with the Panzerfaust. So, uh, squad wise, each squad consists of a sergeant with uh, SMG, three man LMG crew, and a six man rifle. And each squad has access to one Panzerfaust. And finally, in the back, we have an early war German platoon. So, very big platoon. We have four squads. Each squad is a junior leader with submachine gun, six man rifles, three man MG34 uh, team. So, yeah, lots of dudes, four squads. And in the headquarters section, you have a lieutenant with pistol and a platoon sergeant with SMG. And also, you have a two man uh, five centimeter mortar team, which is not very good, frankly. I think it's got HE2, it's got no smoke, so it's. It can do something if you get lucky, but a lot of the time you're going to probably wind up spending the uh, command issues from a senior leader on something else. But he could activate on a one, so it is it's it is what it is. It's not that great. So next I'll look at the uh, German special rules. So the Germans, uh, they have two special rules, national characteristics they're called. Uh, both of them affect infantry. So the first one is machine gewehr. Uh, when a leader is attached to a machine gun team and uses two or more command initiatives to direct the fire, he may add that many D6 to the team's firepower dice. So it does specify team. Um, so that means that with two command initiatives, which the junior leader only has two, he can order one team to fire two extra dice. It doesn't sound that great. Uh, and really it isn't. It's situational. Uh, you're rarely going to ever want to add two dice to one team and not order the other team to fire with its ten dice. So, really it only comes into effect if one team is the only thing that can see anything. Uh, another caveat to that though is that when you first come in, the first time off a jump off point is considered the only time that your squad leader has total control of the squad and he is allowed to activate and fire the entire squad and do machine gewehr. So the very first time you come in, you could do machine gewehr and get two extra shots. Uh, machine gewehr also works for tri the tripod mounted machine guns as well. So if you have a senior leader attached to a machine gun, he can add three dice to it with machine gewehr. So you'd be shooting 13 shots instead of 10 with the medium machine gun. So the second rule is called Hangernaten. So this is a rule for assaulting an enemy. Uh, when a leader attached to a team or squad uses two command initi initiatives, he may lead a charge against an enemy within 12 inches, preceded by a hail of grenades. So you declare you're going to use hand grenaden. Pick your target, and you roll a d6. Um, you can either get you can get from one to three grenades hitting the target. So on a one or two, you get one grenade hit. Three or four, you get two grenade hits. On a five or six, you get three grenade hits. So they toss a bunch of grenades and then they charge in. Um, grenades will do uh, two hits in the open if the target is in the open. So each hit will be two. So if you got three 
if you roll a five or six and you got three grenade hits, that's actually going to be six hits. And I believe they ignore cover and everything. And if the target is in a trench or a bunker or an enclosed space, it actually goes up to three hits. And then after you throw the grenades, you can move with 3d6 to try to initiate close combat. So I would suggest you don't initiate close combat unless you're, the target is already pinned or completely combat ineffective before you charge in because in this game close combat is deadly for both sides. Even if you win, the squad will never be the same again, most likely. So soften up your target, pinning them is the best way to do it because that halves their dice or hitting them from behind also uh, can do that as well. But generally you don't want to be charging against a full squad with machine guns in cover because you're going to get you're going to get jacked up. Um, so those are the two German rules and the three different types of German squad or platoons. So after this, we'll go ahead and pull out the uh, British. So here we have your typical British platoon. This platoon you're going to see pretty much anywhere that the British are fighting in the war. Far East, Northwest Europe, Africa. It's all the same setup. Um, little, very little variation. There's some in the very beginning of the war. They had four-man rifle teams instead of six. Uh, but they boosted those up pretty much right at the beginning of the war. So you're not going to see very many of those uh, four-man rifle teams sections in the uh, British list. So this squad, or platoon, consists of three sections. The British call them sections, not squads. And each uh, section is a Sten-armed corporal in charge of a six-man rifle team and a three-man Bren team. So the Bren is a top-fed magazine, well, magazine fed uh, magazine on top uh, but it's only got six fire dice so it's less firepower than the uh, belt fed machine gun but it's still decent uh, if you get reduced to one man in the crew that will drop by two shots to four so in the squad you also have a piot or in the platoon I should say not squad so the piot is your organic anti-tank weapon and I'm sure everyone's heard of a piot in this game, it's got a 36 inch range, which is pretty good, um, but that's out in the third range band. And an AP of 7, so it's not going to scare too many heavy tanks, but normal sized tanks, it, it can scare them and do some damage. And if you get lucky, you can hurt uh, Panther or Tiger, get a good roll. Uh, we also have a Lieutenant with pistol, or however you want to arm them. Uh, early war, it's pistol, and later war, it can be Sten, pistol, or rifle. And then we have a platoon sergeant who is armed with a Sten or an SMG, really. And he has a Thompson. And then we get to the final unit in the platoon, which is the two-inch mortar. So two-inch mortars are really good in this game. Now, they're not throwing out a lot of HE. I think they only get two shots with HE for the game. But they have unlimited smoke. And the smoke they drop is a three-inch ball of smoke. And they can fire that every phase they're activated. So you can get a quite the smoke cloud out there. Uh, from a two inch mortar, especially if you bring an extra one as a support unit, you can get wall of smoke event over time, but that can come back to bite you in the butt too if somehow the turn ends on a triple six or someone uses a chain of command dice to end it and you're using that smoke to conceal your advance and it's gone all of a sudden, then you got trouble. So um, that's pretty much it for the British. They do have an airborne platoon. I don't have an, I have some of the airborne platoon, but not a full platoon, so I didn't get it out. Um, but Airborne Platoon is elite, and its force rating is plus eight, with six command dice. And it consists of a uh, lieutenant and platoon sergeant with the submachine guns, the Piat, the two-inch motor, but also has a sniper team in the platoon headquarters. It has two sections with a Sten Arm Sergeant, and an LMG team with three crew, and a five-man rifle team with one Sten in the rifle team. And then it's got a third section with a sergeant arm with a Sten, and it's got uh, two Bren uh, guns. One is an LMG team, Bren with three crew and one Sten, and then the other one's a rifle team with a Bren gun with three crew and one Sten. I don't know why they called it one rifle and one LMG. They're both LMG teams. So, and also it has a sniper rifle in the third in the third section as well. So, yeah, it's a very interesting setup for them. Um, but that's basically it for the British. You're not going to see a whole lot of variety for them. Not like the, the Germans, you have quite a few different platoons. 
So British national characteristics, they have two of them that affect infantry. The first one's called five rounds a minute, or five rounds rapid, I should say. When a leader is attached to a rifle team and uses two or more command initiatives to activate the team, he may add that many D6 to the team's firing dice to reflect his controlling the rapid fire. So pretty much it's the same as machine gewehr, uh, except for only for rifles. So you add a few shots to the rifles if you use a two command initiatives or more from a leader. The third, the second rule is a, a pretty interesting rule. It's called one, uh, concentrated fire. When a leader is attached to a Bren team and uses two command initiatives, the team may focus their fire against one enemy team, even when other teams are present within four inches of the target. So normally when you're firing on a target, every uh, other enemy unit or team in the, within four inches of your target will get to share some of those hits uh, that go on to when you roll your to hit dice. So you may get 15 hits on a bunch of shooting, but if there's five teams around, they're going to get three each. So it really lessens the effect of the shooting, and that's a good tactic to play in this game, is to have plenty of guys to share hits and, and support each other uh, on the firing line. But this rule uh, allows you uh, to a uh, leader to use two command initiatives to focus fire on one team. So if you have a tripod mounted machine gun, you know, kind of nestled in with a couple of squads around it, you can focus all the Bren fire onto that machine gun team and, and whittle it down. So it's a great rule, one that we've never, we never see that rule play here. Uh, we should see it more often, but it seems like there's always something else to do. But uh, anyway, that's it for the British, so we'll go ahead and look at the Americans. Here we have the standard American uh, rifle platoon. Don't take it very much through the war. Um, so. What this platoon consists of is three squads. Each squad consists of eight riflemen and a BAR team, which is a BAR and a, an extra crew and then an extra rifleman and then a sergeant armed with a submachine gun. So you got three of those. Headquarters section is a lieutenant with carbine, a platoon sergeant with submachine gun, and then a bazooka team. So they have their own built-in anti-tank as well. Bazooka's decent, uh, it's nothing, well, actually it's a little bit better than the Piat. It's got the same AP7, but it does have a 48 inch range. So it can shoot further. Uh, 48 inch range isn't the, from 24 to 48 is in the third range man. So the farther away it gets, the harder it gets to hit, but it's better than not having anything. Um, they don't have a machine gun. They have the BAR and the BAR only fires three shots. Uh, they do have a good special rule though, the BAR and the Garands, they can re-roll ones. So any uh, shooting that you roll a one on, you can re-roll those and that's just to kind of kind of account for the, um, the self-loading semi-automatic Garands and the BAR. So that's a great rule if you can remember to roll the ones. Uh, every time I played I seem to always forget. So uh, another weapon that the Americans have access to that is very effective is the 50 caliber machine gun five-man crew same stats as the tripod belt fed at 10 shots with 24 inch range but it reduces cover by one one level so soft cover becomes no cover hard cover becomes soft cover which is big really big in this game so that is a great weapon to take uh, if you have one if you don't I suggest you get one if you want to play chain of command as Americans Soviets actually have one as well the Dushka and that's got the same stats. So that's the Soviet rifle platoon. There's one more, uh, well, they have an airborne platoon as well. Uh, their airborne platoon's uh, force rating is only plus one, so it's not really that uh, that high like the Fallschirmjäger or the British paratroopers. They are still elite, though, and they do get six command dice, and the platoon uh, consists of a lieutenant with carbine, platoon sergeant with SMG, a bazooka team, Two squads with a LMG, I'm an SMG sergeant. They do have an LMG team. It's the M19 uh, 1A4 machine gun with three crew. And then it has an assault team of eight paratroopers with Durand rifles. It also has a 60mm uh, mortar squad with five crew. I don't quite have enough airborne to field that uh, platoon yet, but one day I might. So there's one more. Uh, United States platoon we're going to look at is the Armored Rifle Platoon. Here we have the American Armored Rifle Platoon, one of my favorite platoons in the game. Uh, it's got a platoon rating, force rating of plus four because it has a lot of firepower as you'll see in a minute. So to start out we got uh, two senior leaders, platoon sergeant, lieutenant, both with carbine. 
and we have a headquarters squad. So right now I have it set up as bazooka. So it has an option to remove two of the men. There's seven rifles and a sergeant. You can take two of the men out and replace it with the bazooka team, which is awesome. And we have two squads, big squads. So you got 10 men with rifles. You got an SMG, and then you have a sergeant with a Garand. And they also have the option to remove two men and replace them with the bazooka team. So you could bring three bazooka teams with this platoon. Be kind of hard to control three bazooka teams, but it's possible. Um, then over here, you have a mortar squad, so a 60, in, 60 millimeter mortar. This is actually 81. I haven't finished building my uh, 60 yet, but I'm getting there. Five man crew. And then you have a machine gun squad, which consists of two machine guns. Each one is a tripod mounted belt fed machine gun with all the rules of a regular tripod mounted belt fed machine gun. 10 shots, 24 inch range and five crew each with a sergeant with Garand. So overall a very effective, very large platoon. So national characteristics for the Americans. So they have a really good one. Um, they're both infantry but one of them, only one of them is really shooting related. Um, so when a leader, it's called, what first one's called marching fire. When a leader is attached to a team or a squad and uses two or more command initiatives to activate them, they may move with 1d6 and fire at full effect, or move with 2d6 and fire with half effect. So normally a squad can move 1d6 and fire at half effect, or move 2d6 and not fire at all. But since these guys have garands, or you know, semi-automatic, they're rapid fire, to uh, account for that in the game, they're letting... Um, they're letting us use them to, or we can move more effectively and fire with them. So instead of half effect with 1d6, we can move with 1d6 and fire still at full effect, or we can move 2d6 and fire at half effect. So we can move twice as fast and shoot twice as much as other armies, which is really good. And of course the re-roll ones, if you remember, it even says right here in the book, don't forget they also re-roll ones. So I guess that's quite, for, quite uh, a forgotten rule. The second rule they have is a scout rule. So when a U.S. squad leader sends out his two-man scout team, they may move with 1d6 or 2d6 and assume a tactical stance at the end of their movement. They are within line of sight of their squad leader. He can activate them for one command initiative without being in command range. So scouts in this game, you can break off scout teams of two men, and you can send them. They become their own team, and they move to scouting. So what that's effective is if you're attacking and an enemy is not wanting to show his cards, uh, he's not deploying, he's waiting and waiting and waiting, you could form a scout team and you could send them towards his jump off points and force him to react. Uh, it's a little dangerous to do that. The scout team more than likely will get blown away and then you're rolling a bad thing. But it can make him show his hand if he's not doing it. And that's it for the Americans. So I do have uh, U.S. Marines as well. I guess I should break out some Marines because they have a quite uh, unique um, platoon set up. So here we have the U.S. Marine Corps Type D platoon. This is a 1942-1943 setup. So no bazooka, um, but we have three squads. So each squad is six rifles. These actually always are armed with the uh, Springfield rifle. But you can't upgrade them to be, uh, Garands if you use a support point per squad, I believe it is. Something like that. Uh, but the squad, each uh, line squad is six rifles, a rifle armed sergeant, and a BAR uh, with one crew, and then an extra rifleman. It's three of those. There's also a BAR squad, which consists of two BARs, one crew each, with two extra riflemen, and then three more riflemen. So a pretty good sized squad just on its own base of fire squad I suppose and that's led by a sergeant and then it is uh, senior leaders you have a lieutenant with carbine and a platoon sergeant with carbine uh, so that's it for the type D platoon and rules wise they have the same scout rule but they also have a superior marksmanship uh, USMC put much emphasis on weapon skills to reflect this when a leader is attached to a fire team, he uses two or more command initiatives to activate the team. He adds that number of D6 to his dice. So it's kind of like the rapid fire rule for the British or machine gewehr for the um, Germans, but it's for the US Marines and their rifles. So that's the Type D platoon. Now we'll take a look at a different type of platoon, the F type. So here we have the Marine F series, which is 1944-45 platoon. So this is a very unique platoon. Uh, it's 
broken down into fire teams. Oh, and the D type, I have to make a correction. They're actually not two separate teams. The squads are just one big uh, team, like the Japanese or the Russian teams, which we'll see in a second. But the F type platoon is a very unique uh, setup. It's very hard to control as well. So each squad is consisting of three fire teams. So here's one squad. So you have a fire team here, fire team here, fire team here. Each fire team is a BAR with two rifles and a team leader led by a sergeant squad leader. And you have three of those squads. So you have nine teams to control. Um, and each one has a junior leader with only two command initiatives. But there is a rule in here for uh, team leaders. So fire team leaders. So the fire team leaders can activate on a two, and he has one command initiative with a three inch range. So not great, uh, he can control one team on a, on a two, which isn't that great. Um, and the, the junior leader only has two, so very hard to, uh, to maneuver these guys, very hard to do a whole lot. You do have two senior leaders again, and a bazooka team. So I have tried to use this once. It was it was unwieldy. Uh, it was tough to maneuver. It was I had a lot of stuff to do and not enough dice to do it. So it's it's a challenge. Let's just say that. But it's pretty cool. I like it. Uh, I might give it another try. Uh, you can also have um, different uh, accessories. Like in F series, you get a demolition kit, uh, charge per squad, or you can remove two riflemen for a flamethrower team. This can be done for each squad, so you could be rolling in with three flamethrowers. So that would be pretty pretty scary to see coming at you. But that's the Type F uh, USMC platoon. So we'll go ahead and look at the Japanese So here we have the later war Japanese platoon. There is an earlier war one. It's got more men in it. I don't have enough Japanese to actually field that platoon. But the Discharger squad has like four man crew per, per Discharger, which is a lot. So we'll just focus on this uh, 1942 um, on platoon. So we start off, we got two senior leaders. We got a lieutenant with sword and pistol, and a platoon sergeant with rifle. We have a grenade discharger squad. So these are like these are the new mortars. They fire two HE each, and they believe they each have one smoke grenade. And two crew per. And they can use rifles as well. Um, I believe the minimum range is 12 inches on those. So anything closer than that, they can use rifles um, on. And we got three line squads. Each line squad consists of a corporal in charge with a rifle, five uh, rifles, and a LMG team with three crew. So it's one big squad. There's no teams like the Germans. And the Chinese, or not Chinese, the Japanese uh, LMGs are not as good. They only fire five shots, but they are equipped with a sling and bayonet and in the assault they are counted as an SMG. So you get to add 2d6 to your assault rolls if you're rolling in with a uh, light machine gun. So that's okay. I think I'd rather have them more, uh, more shots, but whatever. So that is a Japanese platoon. And the Japanese special rules, they have for the Emperor, which basically means that they cannot be forced off the table by reducing their morale to zero. When they get to zero, they just continue on as if they had one command dice left. And, uh, yeah, so you can't drive them off the board. You literally have to kill them down to the last man. And then they have another rule called fixed bayonets. The Japanese soldier was drilled in bayonet fighting more than any other nation. It being seen as the deciding weapon in combat. Japanese tactics were to pin a target with part of their force while other uh, units moved into the flanks to deliver an unstoppable charge. To reflect the, this training, the Japanese in 1941 and 42 were always considered aggressive. Okay, well, that's not even this platoon. That's the early platoon. But aggressive lets you add dice in uh, close combat as well. So they're more of a close combat oriented army, obviously, the bonsai charge and whatnot. So that is a Japanese platoon. So we got one platoon left to look at, and that is the Russians. Here we have the standard Russian platoon, uh, later war. So we got a lieutenant armed with pistol, and we got three line squads. Uh, again, no teams, just one big, t one big squad which is advantageous uh, in itself when you're trying to buy entrenchments because you only got to buy entrenchments for one team instead of two teams. So you're saving yourself uh, twice the cost of entrenchments when you have big squads like this, but they're not as flexible. Anyway, so you have a 
Uh, three squads, all identical. Two man light machine gun. It's again a magazine fed, so six shots with two crew and seven rifles and a uh, sergeant armed with a uh, submachine gun. That is the Russian platoon. They have another platoon, a tank rider platoon uh, that can be elite uh, at plus one on their force rating. This platoon, uh, this standard platoon is at minus three on their force rating. So the uh, tank rider platoon would be uh, one LMG with two crew and four SMG guys and an SMG sergeant uh, led by a lieutenant with pistols. So I have never tried the uh, tank rider platoon yet. Well, it would be kind of cool to have a lot of SMGs out on the board like that. Great for getting up in their face and get within SMG range and just hose them down. So the Soviet uh, national characteristics. Uh, nothing special for the infantry really. Uh, they have Wrath of the Gods, which is great. Uh, it doesn't really pertain to the infantry platoon though. Uh, so it works as a normal free game barrage, but the enemy units attempting to deploy onto the table in the first turn will roll with minus one on their dice. So instead of coming in on a four plus, they come in on a five plus through the uh, Soviet free game barrage. And their other rule is rad Razvedshiki, whatever. <laughs> uh, the Soviets place much emphasis on the use of scouts, be they men deployed from a rifle squad or dedicated scout unit. Soviet scout teams can move 1d6 or 2d6 and assume a tactical stance at the end of their movement. So like the American rule, not as good though because the leader can't uh, activate them like the American uh, squad leader can. So that's pretty much it for the Soviets. They don't have a lot of options. Uh, in some of the pint-sized campaigns, they have different squad formats or platoon formats. Uh, the one uh, we did uh, storming the citadel. There's actually a four squad platoon, and one of two of the squads have two light machine guns in it. So that's kind of cool. All right. So if I said the Soviet platoon was the last platoon, I lied because there's one more I want to look at, and this is the French platoon. So this is the last army I have a platoon for. Um, this is pretty much the last army I did, full army. Um, not not for sharp practice, that is, but the last uh, chain of command army I've done. So. French platoon. It's a regular infantry platoon. Force rating plus one. So they're led by a lieutenant with a pistol and they have a platoon sergeant who is an inferior junior leader. So he's only got two command initiatives. Now that's just one of the French special rules. They just their, their command structure and the way they were designed to fight the war didn't place a lot of emphasis on uh, individual leadership or initiative of leaders. It was more based on the doctrine and following the plan. So to reflect that, uh, they made the platoon sergeant an, an inferior junior leader with only two command initiatives. So we got the two leaders, we got three uh, line squads. Each squad consists of a sergeant with rifle and a LMG section. This is a magazine fed six shot LMG. Now with two crew, four riflemen, and that has a separate team of four rifles. And there's three of those squads. And then they also have a VB launcher squad. It consists of a VB launcher uh, corporal who's in charge of the squad. He has his own VB launcher, and then there's three more VB launchers that technically they come out of the line squads, but in practice the French would put them all into one squad led by the corporal. Uh, one of the rules in, for the French is that they can be allocated back to the squads. So each squad can have a VB launcher and it has to be fired with a command initiative from the junior leader. So game-wise, probably better to keep them in a group uh, with the VB launcher corporal so that they can all fire together. I believe they only have three rounds, I believe it is, and then they run out. And then uh, after that, they can fire with rifles or you can spend a point of support to give uh, a man unlimited VB launcher ammo. And the VB launchers are like light mortars, uh, the 2HE, now they do only fire with half effect the first time they're firing at a target and if the target doesn't move and they don't move when they fire again they fire at full effect so they're okay um, better not having them I guess there's they're there so and they can be effective if you use them right so that's the uh, French platoon uh, the other French special rule yeah so both special both French special rules are well first one is the uh, VB launcher one I just described about how the uh, you can group them into one squad, you can put them back in their in, uh, nor normal squad, or during the game a senior leader can order them back into a squad. And their other uh, special rule is the special rule about the platoon sergeant being a, an inferior senior leader. So obviously not any great special rules for infantry and the French platoon. 
So that's it for the platoon layouts. Um, got all the platoons out, showed them off a little bit, talked about them, and in context of how they would operate in chain of command. So uh, let me know if you guys liked this video. Um, if you do, I can make more of them. I did, I did plan on making one for where I get the platoons on the table with some train and go over some tactics and stuff. So if that's something that people might like to see, I could do that. But uh, yeah, just let me know. So uh, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.